Thanks to everyone who supports Go With The Heat podcast directly. If you'd like to find out more or become one of our supporters, head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 6, titled Line of Fire. Okay, hi everyone. It's our first episode now that Amnesia is officially done. Let's bring on the new kid and the new show. Miami Vice is dead now. (laughs) (laughs) Let's move on. It originally premiered on December 16th, 1988. It is written by Raymond Hartung, who's got one more episode coming, but he was the story editor for essentially every episode in season five. Editor. Editor. (laughs) (laughs) It is directed by Richard Compton. Man, that name sounds really familiar. Oh, yeah. Down for the Count, part one and two. Everyone is in showbiz. The big thaw. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he also did Mirror Image. Interesting. Hmm. So he's kind of all over the map. Yep. <laughs> Hit or miss on he this. He killed Zito. We always remember that. <laughs> to, to be fair, as the producer, most of your job is just selling commercial time. <laughs> How much soap do you think they could sell during Miami Vice? <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, could check in who was in each other's lives. Pals, there's going to be some schedule changes coming up. And I know we talked about at the beginning of the season, and you're like, oh, man, what do you mean more schedule changes? Well, this one's actually for a little bit of a different reason. Melissa and I are expecting our fourth baby. When this episode comes out is roughly about the time when the babies do. So that's also why you've been hearing more pre-recorded episodes from us. As we've been feverishly preparing for our life with a fourth child. (laughs) Yeah, preparing. (laughs) Lots of preparations. (laughs) So the schedule change that we're going to have is, as I mentioned, more pre-recorded episodes when we find time. Also, for the next, say, four or five episodes, we're going to switch to a bi-weekly schedule. So we'll make sure we're plenty up front about when that's going to end. We're not going to go bi-weekly forever. It's just going to be while we have a newborn in the house and plenty of hands around to make sure the newborn is being taken care of along with our toddler. <laughs> the nervous laugh from Melissa. Oh, yeah. just be honest. You guys are just going to be, you guys are just being lazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Four kids. God, that's nothing. I've got two dogs and I'm thinking about getting a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> We're very excited. We're very happy. We didn't think ahead of time of when it would fit in with our podcast schedule and that would <laughs> yeah, almost <I> know. <laughs> be the end of season of the whole show run. In fact, that didn't, that didn't come, didn't come into factor at all. No, it's just, interesting. It's I don't know so, about that. <laughs> question, guys. Does that mean that if we end the show when the ba- at the same time that the ba- uh, you have the baby, Melissa, does that mean we have to name the baby Crockett? <laughs> Well, the baby's a girl, so... Gina Trudy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Gina I'm not Trudy. naming my girl Crockett, sorry. <laughs> well, speaking of young children and Sunny having to do some babysitting, <laughs> let's go to talk about this episode of Vice where, you know, they get put in charge of making sure that someone's protected before a court case. We all know how this is going to go. <laughs> let's go break down this week's episode. Mm-hmm. Do they not keep tally of... How many witnesses have been shot on their watch? Like there should be literally like outside OTV, there should be a sign that says, you know, five days since last witness shot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, maybe we shouldn't ask these guys. It's only been five days. I mean, it was only like how long ago that Crockett was shooting people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean <laughs> put the man with brain damage in charge of protecting a witness. <laughs> Let's put him alone on a boat. Yeah. <laughs> when we open up, we're at a court case. Sonny is testifying in front of everyone. And for a moment, I thought, okay, this is it. This is when they're going to try Sonny for murder and all those people. But no, they're actually, he's really relaxed. Yes. I hope Formal jean attire. I was going to say, I hope he's not on trial (laughs) if he's wearing a jean jacket. (laughs) Sonny is there testifying about Carlos Quintero, who's also there studying the court case, apparently. Because, you know, it's Miami. And it's kind of open courtroom, so you just kind of do what you want. <laughs> so Carlos's lawyer then brings up Sonny's amnesia. Like, how can we trust you? Didn't you think that you were a murderous crime lord slash pirate sailed <laughs> about the seven seas of Florida, murdering all of your competition? Also, he tried to kill your best friend. <laughs> all of which is true. Yeah, yeah but Tub- Tubbs was totally cool with it, though. Like, go ahead and <laughs> ask him. He's right there. Like, totally cool with me shooting him. 
<laughs> What's fantastic? For the record, I shot, him, I shot him twice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What's fantastic about this scene is that Sonny tries to lie and say that he was undercover because he thinks that the records are supposed to be sealed. So when they bring up, like, hey, what about when you thought you were Sonny Burnett? And he's trying to say, well, I was undercover. Well, didn't you try and murder your partner? And you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. Well, that was different. See, I had uh-huh. an M. That was a different <laughs> kind of undercover. <laughs> <laughs> the court goes to recess and Sonny mentions to the lawyer, to the district attorney, he thought the records were supposed to be sealed. And that's when Cantero comes up and it's like, hey, I don't mind. I don't mean to interrupt you here. But you know that Detective Dexter Sims tried to infiltrate my gang? I'm going to try and do that to you, too. Scuffle. They pull Carlos out, and then the duo leave. Outside, Sonny is lamenting to Tubbs about how the modern-day trials in Miami just seem to let everyone off. They can't get enough evidence to ever be able to convict anyone. It's always just a show. And Tubbs says, if they can't get Carlos, yeah. then they'll just start picking off his lieutenants one at a time. But uh, you can understand, you know, Crockett's fr- uh, frustration. Like he says, he's pushing more flake than Tony the Tiger. <laughs> he's just he's just direct competition as Burnett. He's got to find a way to put Carlos out of business or he's never going to get back on top of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny basically says it's no use to city as a shithole. Yeah, like that's, that's like, what it comes down to. shambles, basically. <laughs> if Vice didn't end at the end of this season, Sonny probably would have left the show to go be a sheriff in a small town. <laughs> a small town where they murdered everyone. Just then a car pulls up and tries to do a drive-by on the transfer bus for the jurors. And then drives away. Obviously, in front of a courthouse, there's enough cops to be able to chase anyone down. No, I mean, why like, even bother? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before we get into the rest of the show, this is our chance to check in with the guest stars. This one's a little bit different because of a certain undercover officer who's going to make a couple of reappearances later in the show. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think we'll start with him. Justin Lazard played DEA agent and Metro Day detective Joey Harden. You'll learn more about Joey Harden at the end of this episode, but he does end up in two more episodes of Vice. He's uh, listed as an actor, producer, director, and model. So I don't know how much of any of those things he's really good at. He had a weird run, and I feel like he's that he's that story of trying to get famous that you never hear. He started out in TV commercials. He got a small role in a movie called Spike of Benson Hurst in 1988. He did an he did this episode of Vice while making a few cameos. He started modeling to money so that he could take acting classes he started modeling take acting classes after his time on vice <laughs> remember that well, i mean that was probably a wise decision after he did vice <laughs> and then he had some serious serious bad luck either that or the acting classes didn't work <laughs> because he was in a series regular in an unsuccessful cbs show called second chances that ran for only one year. He then joined CBS's Central Park West in the second season, which was then canceled after the second <laughs> season. <laughs> There's a theme here. Maybe he's just bad luck. It's the final it, season of Vice. And that was one in season 95. of another show. Season two, that was ended up being the last season of another show. Like Yeah. Uh-huh. And then so that was in ninety-five. And then in ninety-seven, he was part of the cast. For Extreme, a show about Rocky Mountain rescue workers that only lasted seven episodes. Um, so, wow. <laughs> he followed that. He followed that with a direct-to-video movie called The Big Fall. Those are my favorite kind of direct-to-video. Uh, then, with a partnership, because obviously it was the option of roles he was taking, he partnered up with. His brother, Mark, and they started Lazard Productions. Lazard Productions produced several movies, the biggest of probably being Species 2, <laughs> Dark that- Harbor, and Stanley's Game. For the record, their first, like, one of their biggest movies is Species 2, and that's known, like, the reason why everyone knows Species 2, because it's essentially a porno. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But Justin Lazard plays a good role in that porno. <laughs> And he paid for it to be made. Moving on. <laughs> we have Kev- 
<laughs> we have Kevin Major Howard as FBI agent Bates. He was the Canadian actor most no known for playing Rafter Man in Co Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. He was also a team TV show playing the anti-hero Marcus. A few other movies that he was in, Death Wish 2, Sudden Impact, and Alien Nation. Oh, sweet. He's got a list of uh, <laughs> movies. He might be our biggest guest star. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Alien Nation? I mean, come on. Uh, our next guest star is Aaron yeah, Ibel. He plays Carlos Cantero. He's an Israeli-American actor, known for roles in both American and UK films. His career goes back actually all the way to the 70s. He was in Fiddler on the Roof. Happy Hooker goes to Hollywood in 1980. Classic. Listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's happy. Also in, also, in 1980, he was in the classic Xanadu. So, uh, uh, yes. if you like uh, um, roller skating. Roller skating. Is it roller sk and then it was in Son of the Pink Panther in 93. And followed that up with The Mummy in 99 and The Mummy Returns in 2001. So, some of his TV credits, Dynasty, Kojak, Love Boat, MacGyver, Charlie's Angels. Unfortunately, he passed away from cancer in 2016. Moving on to our next guest star, Barry Primus. He plays FBI agent Daly. Uh, he's an actor and director and writer. He was a stage actor for the first decade of his career. And then he would appear in shows like The Defenders and The Virginian. That, that would leave the mo movie work like Autopsy in 75, Motherhood in 68, and Heartland in 79. Also Night Games in 80. Probably most known for his reoccurring role as Cagney's boyfriend in the TV show Cagney and Lacey from 1982 mm -hmm. to 88. When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the courthouse. Tubbs and Crockett are, and the police are looking over the jurors. Basically, it was just a drive-by. But two FBI officers come up and say, we're agents Randolph and Bates. We want you to come with us. We have something to talk about it. And Sonny tries to say, nah, it's cool. Like, we're done. They're like, no, you're going to come with us right now. So we go over to the FBI office. And this is where they're hearing from the FBI that they have a witness that saw a DEA agent be killed and can finger Carlos. That's Dexter Sims. That was in the in the opening. That's who got killed by one of Cantero's men. They want Miami Vice to protect this witness who saw the DEA agent get killed for three days, three whole days. Mm. Okay, that it's, sounds like three days too long. <laughs> it's seventy two hours. That's well outside of how long they can handle someone, but. They couldn't even protect the jury. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to cooperate in the first place, so they're not really motivated, you know, to, to try and help, you know, right now. Plus, they've had some bad experiences with the FBI. Turns out one in five of you are dirty. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So I don't know if we want to get into all this. Tubbs even asked, why would you want local police to handle this? Why can't you guys take care of your own stuff? And he doesn't say that they think that there's someone dirty inside of their office. He actually says, because you guys are on the ground and know the lay of the land, we're busy taking care of all this other stuff. We want you to take care of them. Also, Carlos has a million dollar hit out on the witness. So up to Annie. Lots of people are going to be coming at him. Vice Squad likes the challenge. <laughs> I was thinking, hopefully it's not a woman, because then Tubbs and Croc would have to fight over who gets the boner. Exactly. And it's Tubbs. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have is, a chart. Like, we keep track. <laughs> they have like a chart. They know. Tubbs hasn't boned anyone for a while. So. It's his turn. <laughs> the FBI also says. Actually, I think it's Trudy's turn, technically. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I know, right? We don't, we don't anybody. get to see any of that dating life. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the FBI also says that they feel better with them being with the vice crew because no one would be looking for them with vice because no one would ever leave witnesses with these people. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows how they are. Uh -huh. The FBI take him down to the witness, but then they say, okay, here he is inside of this room. Good luck. And Sonny asks, hey, are you going to come in? He's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm going to pass on this one. We've already seen him. <laughs> That's what they say. Like, yeah, we've yeah. seen him. <laughs> Inside <laughs> is this young 20-something laying on the table with his boombox turned up to max volume. He's got his hair spiked up whoa, and his sleeves whoa, whoa, cut whoa, off. Whoa. whoa, what are you watching? I saw some 40-year-old pretending to be a high school kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
He's a 35-year-old pretending to be a high school kid. Here's what we can all agree on. This is exactly how it went in casting. They they picked out Lazard and they said, okay, listen, we don't have a script for you. You just do your thing. What we want you to do is we want you to watch 21 Jump Street and bring some of that Johnny Depp goodness over to Miami <laughs> Vice because we're like not, you know, that show is really scaring us. And so you should like come do that here on Miami Vice, please. Yeah. And I'm sure that everyone on the cast of 21 Jump Street was really scared of that. <laughs> because, you know, that guy could compete with Johnny Depp. <laughs> I feel like it would have gone so much better had he had taken the acting classes first. I think so. I think that would have been the correct act. Keith Mollis is this guy's name, as in Hollis and Mollis. <laughs> <laughs> he says, the vice always knows where it's at in some of his, quote, and they are, quote, his G-dudes. And then I'm sorry, that sounds like off firm that you see on, like, a park bench. <laughs> Hollis and Mollis. Call Hollis and Mollis. Did you break your leg at the Super Bowl? Get call Hollis and Mollis. Sonny is already super irritated. He does not want to deal with Keith. He says that his music is trash, and will you please leave the room? I want to get this done as soon as possible. Sonny, you're, you're on a fixed timeline. It's 72 hours is what you got. <laughs> you can't, you can't like, speed, speed it, up. it up. He's walking around the room, and, and Sonny's, uh, yeah, don't look out the windows. Like, I, I, don't want, I don't want any more paperwork, you know? <laughs> We know you're not going to make it because we put you up in a hotel instead of one of the safe houses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they do not act at all like they're protecting someone. The whole time they're protecting them. Like they're watching baseball and eating food and just kind of hanging out with them. You know, but no one's like actually watching him or protecting him. <laughs> they are so uh, happy I, to know. let him just go into his room and turn on the music at full volume. Which, I don't know about you, I could never find any TV channels in the 80s that played nothing but metal. No, like, where was he at? Where was that? <laughs> I would have loved that. It was yeah. supposed to be MTV. It was clearly supposed to be MTV, but they didn't we play metal We used to like have that. to stay up until like 2 in the morning before mm -hmm. they'd play any metal. And even then, it'd be in between episodes of Beavis and Butthead, which I'm not complaining about. <laughs> it's just that's the way that it yeah. was. <laughs> Keith says he's never been to Miami. He wants to go hit the club. Sorry. He wants to go out and party. And suddenly he says, no way. My job and you stay here in this hotel room. We're here for three days, and then you can leave and do whatever you want to. I don't care. Keith is just going to go sulk in his room the entire time then. Hey, guys, what does the Vice Squad have against Frosted Flakes? <laughs> I think first, there was that first there was that, <laughs> that Tony the Tiger, uh, <laughs> tiger comment earlier. Yeah, first we had that Tony the Tiger comment, which was a little off color from Crockett earlier. I mean, I <laughs> Tony's not known for doing blow, but okay. <laughs> and then now, now they're eating sugar cats, which is clearly a knockoff of Frosted Flakes. He's eating it with Can soda. Can give the tiger some love? He poured soda in the yeah. bowl. That's why they're like, that's that's going to rot your brain. That, that's like addictive. He, yeah, he's got soda in the bowl. Because <laughs> he's so metal. He's so crazy. I'm such a crazy teenager. This is what the crazy young guys do, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe you wouldn't put soda in the bowl if the Vice Squad would splurge for some name brand for Austin Flakes. <laughs> Can we get some Tony the Tiger in the house? <laughs> I thought it was really interesting that they continue to argue about what food is bad for you and what's good for you. Because, A, it's such a middle-aged conversation, just like talking about your favorite grocery store. Exactly. But also, they're doing it in front of the vegetarian. And Tubbs is like, I, I'm not going to participate in this conversation. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, the scene typically ends with the kids saying, when I grow up, I'm going to be in a punk band. And then it storms <laughs> off to his room. Sonny's just having, like, these overt personal problems with dealing with Keith. Because he's essentially Sonny, what Sonny was like when, when he was a kid. Now he's an old man with a dead wife. And he's a different man after going on a murderous rampage. Yeah. He doesn't get it anymore. Well, I mean, he doesn't have very much experience dealing with a teenager. If he had a teenager of his own, he would <laughs> or know. Or a kid of his own, at all. <laughs> <laughs> for that matter. Well, I would assume that if he had a kid, he would probably be a teenager at this point and living <laughs> with his mom and stepdad um, in Ohio or wherever. But he doesn't. He doesn't have any kids. So why would he be good with a teenager? Keith takes this opportunity while everyone's arguing about food and watching baseball. And Trudy's like, look, I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with this. Tubbs and Trudy are like, yeah, mm -hmm. white people would be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I'm going to go get my hair did. 
he takes the opportunity to go out the window and just escape and go off to a club. This is terrible, too, because Switek's watching the entire time. <laughs> so he calls them upstairs in the room and says, hey, you guys might want to go get him rather than get out of the car and get the witness or at least follow him in the car. At least if he didn't get a start the car and follow him to the next club. No, no, I'm going to call Crockett and Tubbs. Like, this is your guys's problem. Come downstairs and deal with it. Tubbs and Sonny see after they get the phone call, they run in the room, see that he's gone. They run downstairs. They ask the bellhop who says, oh, there's only a couple clubs in town that play heavy metal music. So, he, yeah, so they just, split up. Yeah, he told him about those clubs. Like he mm -hmm. said, like, I told him about these two clubs, this one and that one. By the way, the kids dressed as Indiana Jones. So <laughs> once again, our 35-year-old high school student. <laughs> not a... So now we're over at the club. It's a metal punk show. Actually, a pretty good like club and like good metal scene that's happening. I'm actually quite impressed with how they set it up. Good pit going. Yeah, it looks like it's a lot of steam. Yeah, it looks like a cameo theater. <laughs> Keith is there having some like, I don't know, like back spasms or something. That's <laughs> not what that he looks like as he's walking around. And he sees a woman that's watching him who we also saw watching from the street in a car. So when Keith escapes, she makes a phone call. And now we see her at the club with him, too. He locks eyes with her and starts back spasming over in her direction. Now, Melissa, when we watched this, at first we were like, why is he going to her? That's kind of weird that that's where he'd be immediately drawn to her. But then later we realized, like, maybe he, as we find out later about what his character is, that he was putting together, oh, hey, this is more serious maybe than I thought. I recognize this person. Yeah, I think he was going to her. He has to because he saw her and then he started acting like a fool. Like, he turned it on. <laughs> so he was doing what he's supposed to be to do, right? I mean, we all know. Spoiler, we know he's a, he's yeah. a decoy. So he's being a decoy and he's doing what he's supposed to do and showing yeah. everybody. And he's supposed to be, well, we find out. I, we're trying to weed out the mole in the FBI. And so he must have recognized her as an FBI agent because he starts acting like the witness rather yep. than the DEA agent. Exactly, yeah. So he's really, um, he turns it on like full speed. Like, you want to dance? You want to do this? And she's like, that's a good point. It. So and we discussed like, why would he leave? Like why he would run out? And at first I was thinking, Oh, he doesn't understand the gravity of the scenario that he's in, like the the role that he's sitting in, and how much in how much danger he's in. Yeah. But another reason why he would go out to this club and go put himself in danger is to root out like who from the FBI, yeah, who from Cantero are following. Him. They're drawing him out, right? Mm -hmm. Because then they then they're following. Yeah. Not, then the other FBI agents are following to see who the yeah. Who they're just is. not telling Vice Squad about it. Yeah. Exactly. Speaking Thanks. of the Vice Squad, Crockett and Dub show up and Crockett is immediately too old for this bullshit. <laughs> like, uh, like, he needs to grab this kid and get out of here now. It might be different if this was like a Huey Lewis in the News concert. <laughs> but, like, he's just not digging this shit. Sonny, old man Crockett drags him back to the hotel and tells him, Keith, you sure made a bonehead mood, pal. Pal. <laughs> uh, so they're going to solve all their problems by getting them drunk. That'll keep them in one place. <laughs> he also mentions that to Keith that Cantero has a million dollar hit out on him. And you can see Keith's like wheel spinning in his head. Like, and I didn't is, realize it was that big of a mm -hmm, thing. Yeah. And this is what I was talking about. That he maybe he doesn't understand like how much danger he's actually in. Yeah, I don't think he does, because in the next scene, he realizes it, and he, he seems genuinely shocked. <laughs> Outside, that woman from, as we said already, this is from the FBI, she makes a phone call. Inside, Sonny's trying to get Keith drunk, telling him how much of a bonehead move he made. One Keith time was... I saw CCR. <laughs> <laughs> then Keith finally <laughs> passes out, while Tubbs and Crockett sit at a state of cat-like readiness. Well, sorry, Crockett doesn't. Tubbs is, because... Crockett's barely staying awake, too. Tub sees some movement outside of the doors. He yells out, Sonny, it's happening. <laughs> yeah, it's going down. <laughs> Vice <laughs> team, before anything happens, just starts firing bullets through the doors at the people who are outside of it. No announcement of who they are. No investigation to see what exactly was happening. Fortunately, it's not some, like, cleaning service <laughs> or something that's on the other side of the door. <laughs> and Tubbs does it with his eyes closed. <laughs> He closes his eyes the whole time he's shooting. <laughs> oh, my God. And it, it's just execution by the contract killers, too, because they're just standing outside the window. The duo just starts firing on them. They don't ever fire back. They just stand outside the window. Like, 
<laughs> Roar! <laughs> We're gonna scare him to death. Come on, guys! You got semi-autos. Like fire a bullet. Keith comes out scared and shocked at what happened. He can't believe, and this is what I'm saying. It's like he's figuring out. Oh man! Yeah, I mean, I'm over not my head. Sick here for three days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People are gonna try and murder me. The next morning, Dad comes to the hotel. It's like, all right, the fuck did you guys do? Like well, how? <laughs> I didn't even want you guys to do this job. <laughs> They're having a little powwow about how they can give them back to the feds. Tubbs is, is pushing. This isn't our responsibility. I don't know why we're doing this. He's in way much more danger than what we thought was going to happen. He should be taken back to the FBI. Or we could put him on the St. Vitus and go out on the ocean and just be on Sonny's boat for the next that few days. That wasn't his idea. That wasn't, that wasn't Tubbs or I, I don't think, dad's idea. <laughs> I don't think that was anyone's idea. I think Crockett just said, like, like screw this. I'm going out on my boat. And they're like, take the kid with you. <laughs> Crockett is very clear that he's going to make sure that this kid stays alive until the his court appearance in a few days. So that's why he's willing to take him all alone out on the ocean on the state by the stance. Which is the name of Sonny's boat, the St. Vitus Stance. I did not know that, actually. <laughs> Castillo's not a fan, but Sonny's going to have his way because he just kind of storms off. Meanwhile, the woman is still waiting outside of the hotel. She's still monitoring everything that's happening. We have a, This is where we're going to find out what her role in this is. She sees Castillo and Stan come running out with someone with a bag over their head, get stuffed into the car, drive away. She follows. Crockett then pulls up in the Testarossa, picks up. Tubbs, I think. No, he picks up the kid. Oh, okay, yeah, he, he picks up the- Keith, mm-hmm. and then they both go down the street and corner the woman who, and then at gunpoint, get her out of the car, and she finally reveals, "Oh, I'm FBI." Yeah, but but Crockett's gone by now. He's already taken. He doesn't stop with her. He's not. Crockett doesn't do anything with the girl. He's gone. He's got right. I don't think. He, I don't think he meets up with them. No, no, he, yeah, you're right. He, he yeah, Crockett's Crockett's gone. He's in the wind. Yep. He's going to take him out on a boat and show him that place where he cries sometimes. <laughs> back at the FBI building, Tubbs is pissed. Bitch slapping Tubbs is back. <laughs> he is not happy with Daly, the person at the FBI that they're dealing with. And I love their excuse. Our heart was in the right place. <laughs> like, we did it for the like, right reason. Really? Yeah, like that, that's your reason for basically using local law enforcement as guinea pigs? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> well, Daly also says he's too important to just leave a, with local yokels. So we want to make sure that we, the FBI had eyes on him, too. It's like, actually, Daly, that's a good idea. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that kind of was. <laughs> well, I love how now he's too important. Okay, when we weren't seriously putting him, his security in your guys' charge, that was okay. But now that we don't know where he is, that's a problem, guys. Like, we don't actually <laughs> trust you. Daly wants to know where Keith is, and Tubbs says, no way, man. You paid for a three-day all-inclusive trip. He'll be back and ready to go. And Daly says, no, like, I'm going to bring you off on charges. And then Tubbs hits him, like, just one, two, bam, bam. Comes back and says, if you want to press charge against me the same way that you do surveillance, I got nothing to worry about. Then he leaves and slams the door. It's like high fives outside immediately. Like, fuck yeah. Yeah. You got him, Tubbs. Oh, yeah. You got him. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the St. Vitus, they're... Some ocean. There's I, somewhere. <laughs> Crockett sells it as it's a big ocean out there. I could go disappear. But meanwhile, he's docked at one of the keys. <laughs> I hide here sometimes when I'm lonely or when I want to get a hooker. <laughs> Old man speak too. Oh, that music you listen to. Like Clapton, that's real music. Track to him to go into a lecture of how Crosby stills and nah. This is the future of rock and roll. You know what's funny is that I never pictured Sonny as being someone who was into rock and roll. I always put him as a country man. So I imagine that when he handed him that tape, I was expecting Alabama. What? Why would he do country? <laughs> they have a nice conversation over some fish. Yep. And or I Sonny's getting ready to go fishing. He's getting his bobber on his line. He's getting fishing. They're not barbecuing fish. My suspicion is frogs, but it could be <laughs> squirrel testicles. Uh, Sonny um, makes a few dad jokes to Keith, but there's one thing that they agree on is that idealism is for fat girls and guitars. Yes. That was yeah. the thing. The precinct, Castillo it gets off the phone with the feds and he tells Tubbs, that obviously, A, Tubbs isn't very popular with the FBI right now. Tubbs says, too bad, they broke the deal. Slams his hands down on Dad's desk. And then they go into yeah. very, very detailed instructions of what's happening. He's out at Elliot Key. He's going to be coming back at 8 p.m. tomorrow at this dock. And they're going to travel this route at these Here's times. And this is what the boat looks like. Back out on the boat, Dad Crockett. 
Well, I'm calling he's <laughs> growing right. up some hot dogs and making mac and cheese for <laughs> Keith. Yeah. Keith I'm just a simple man, saving <laughs> lives. <laughs> you know, for the children. They continue their like heart to heart conversation that they were happening while Sonny was doing the fishing. Now they're eating the fish and they ask why Sonny is a cop and he says that he fits in with low lives. <laughs> but they also continue mm-hmm. to have a nice conversation about what it's like to be cops and you can kind of see through this the entire time that Sonny thinks something's up that Keith isn't just some stupid kid that was a witness there's something else to yeah, him he he's thinks, like digging for information I, I don't act, know right? I don't know I don't I think Sonny feels like his new buddy he met a day ago is just like him he's Crockett Jr. grade the high C's together Sonny does eventually say that he wants to make the world safe for kids not his kid uh, other kids, Bobby or Billy, Jimmy, he like even whatever. Know that like, kid's yeah. safe. <laughs> <laughs> kid. I'm not interested in keeping him safe. He has a kid now, a 35 year old pretending <laughs> to be a high schooler. You know, you guys are going to have to eat your words later on in the season. <laughs> Just saying, <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it for the 29 episodes in between when you, yeah, exactly. you see Jerry. As the day progresses, they're getting more relaxed, getting more friendly with each other. And then suddenly a helicopter comes pulling up out of nowhere and just starts opening fire on the boat. Thank God something finally happened. Get rid of these conversations about feelings and how <laughs> yeah. I feel about and stuff. girls and guitars. <laughs> <laughs> I love that the that the members of the vice squad are always under threat of helicopter attack. <laughs> <laughs> Can happen at any time. The helicopter. Damn it. Give me the flare gun. <laughs> <laughs> the flare gun being what takes down the helicopter. Helicopters don't seem to be very effective. The flare is able to take down a helicopter, and and also you can't use the helicopter for protection because Castillo is able to sniper Morasca from like yeah. seventeen counties away. They don't have any. There's any doors on the thing. That's uh-huh. why <laughs> get a door. <laughs> yeah, Castillo probably never left the station. He was probably sitting in the dark, <laughs> the locker room with his sniper rifle. So now that they've been able to shoot down the helicopter keith is safe keith is in freaking out like how do they find us there's no one that would know that we were ever out here the hotel made sense because i was an idiot and i left so that they were able to figure out where i was staying so maybe it's tubs is the one that sold us out like man you made a terrible mistake here well, shut your mouth boy <laughs> yeah tubs is the only one keeping a secret yeah, and, and Crockett's like, no, Tubbs would never do that to me. Tubbs is at my back so many yeah, times, and I jive. tried to kill him twice, <laughs> and he's still at my back. Exactly. No, he has no reason to have a vendetta against me. <laughs> exactly. The next day, Tubbs and Castillo can't find where Sonny and Keith are. Tubbs at his desk at the precinct. Castillo comes over. There's no word. They call the Coast Guard at the courthouse. Carlos has a note. He finds out that Keith is still alive, that his helicopter attack didn't work. So he tells his lawyer to double the fee. Sounds a two million dollar hit out on Keith. And then Tubbs, because they can't find anyone, we jump over to he's in a helicopter flying around all the keys to try and find the boat, and they can't find him nowhere. I don't know what this has to do with anything because he's supposed to make landfall at a specific port, and he does at this right time. And when did we start watching Magnum PI? When did Tubbs start <laughs> flying helicopters? What's going on here? <laughs> Is Don Johnson going to wear in Hawaiian shirts? Dad talks to Tubbs in the helicopter and says, just come back. I have another task for you anyway. On the same virus, Sonny and Keith are getting Molotov cocktails ready because now they know that it's found out that they're on the boat. Even though they shot down the helicopter that was hunting them, they still know, like, okay, they're more than likely we're going to see people again. Yeah, but man, they're wasting all the beer. And I'm going to tell you the truth, guys. I don't think either of you have got the arm to hit a helicopter with a tough cocktail. <laughs> exactly. Like, uh, I- I'm pretty sure they can hover higher than you. I know, Crockett, I know you played football and you scored a touchdown once for Florida <laughs> S&M. <laughs> Whatever, but I don't think Molotov, co- co- Molotov cocktails are going to help you against another helicopter. <laughs> so now Stan and Tubbs are following up on the lead from Izzy. This is what Dad had called Tubbs back. They found out from Izzy that there was some meat that was going to happen, and that they needed to go follow up on this. They're sitting at the restaurant. They're watching to see well, one of the men there. They know they're able to recognize that works for Cantero. Then they see <laughs> out practically whisk in the restaurant too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're right there. <laughs> <laughs> then they see FBI agent Bates come walking up. He drops an envelope into the trash can. Cantero's man goes over and takes it out of the trash can. And Sid and Tubbs go, 
oh my god, we have another dirty FBI officer, and that's how they're able to find out where Crockett is, and who knows what else is happening. So they go to give chase. This chase scene is the best. <laughs> Stan is able why to catch Stan... somebody. <laughs> he catches them. Yeah, why does Stan have to chase the fast one? And he's the one that catches them. Somehow Stan runs down the fast guy, but Tubbs can't catch slow-ass Agent Bates trying to run in his suit and dress shoes. I don't know. The other guy had a limp, though. <laughs> <laughs> also, they were doing the thing in acting when you're supposed to be running fast and so you like pump your arms and legs but you actually don't move that quickly yeah, so that his way. legs weren't moving <laughs> yeah but you can see stan just wasn't into it he was like Duh. he's like slowly he moving was, his arms he and was legs. running on sand you know how hard that is <laughs> he's wearing dress shoes give the man a break he know, caught but... his guy <laughs> yeah he caught his and then they, they we go to the next scene where they go to interrogate him and we find out that Tubbs and Stan are better partners than, than Tubbs and Crockett. Yeah, they're much better interrogators. Because Tubbs says, you know what? I got an idea here. Let's just let you go. Go ahead. Cantero will totally wonder how you got released and what information you gave up to be released so quickly. So go ahead and go. And don't forget about Dexter Sims. You know, that guy that he killed? Like, go ahead. And the guy starts to walk out the door. And he comes back. That was that was messed up, man. Yeah. He starts crying like a baby. He's like, that was mean, basically. Like, that was so mean. And here's something. We know, like we've talked about the meat bondler and all these other things in the past of the show. And there's this theme of how we like to pick on certain people. Melissa <laughs> has no heart for little bitches. No, I don't. <laughs> that popped in the nose. Too bad. Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> he was there when that, that, because what they were saying was that he was there when that Dexter Sims guy got killed. And he got burned up. Like, they lit him on fire. So it's like a big deal. And he's like, well, he, he wanted to do what he did to Dexter? And he's like, no. <laughs> I could tie it all together for you people. Melissa is Mexican. And although, <laughs> although she is in support of our vice team, she doesn't have any time for snitches. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> snitches get stitches. <laughs> so now Felix, the man's name, that's the man. He caves and says, okay, fine, I'm going to give you all the information. That After you he want. cries like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> so now they're checking the precinct for bugs. So they know now from Felix that they had a line from someone in the FBI. They know that it was Bates. They can put stuff together like maybe that was a bug that was inside of the precinct. They go into Castillo's office and they find it in one of the bookshelves. And then he radios out to Tubbs and Stan who find the FBI van out on the street. Question. I thought dad never leaves his office. He just stays there all night. How did they get the bug into his I have no idea. He must have been taking a shower in the locker room or something. <laughs> this is where they get all upset because the FBI used him as bait, which is kind of ironic because they do that to their own witnesses all the time. They start putting together everything, and then we jump back to Crockett at the law firm known as Hollis Mollis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is crude. Cruising in on the boat, you know, like, oh, Blackwater, keep on rolling. <laughs> they pull up to Compton Point at the right time when they're supposed to. There's three men that are waiting for them to come up because they know where they're going to land because the bug in Castillo's office, Castillo. <laughs> it's all your fault. They come pulling up. Everything looks like it's going to be fine. But then the men come out and there starts a shootout. Keith hides. He runs down below deck while Sonny is having a shootout. He shoots and kills two. They throw the Molotov cocktails and blow up someone's boat stuff to be dry docked right there. Ouch. Then Bates comes out. Just and for shit to giggle, too. The boat wasn't a threat at all. They just wanted to burn it. This is when Bates comes popping out. He kills the last one. And, of course, Sonny, he doesn't know any better. He recognizes Bates as being a, an FBI officer. They haven't had any radio contact with the vice team or anything, so they don't know that he's dirty. They come out. Keith comes running up. He's happy to be off the boat and back on the land, even though they were, like, docked the entire time. And, oh, whatever, anyways. yeah. Sonny steps to the side. They're ta he's talking to Bates. Bates pulls out his gun, shoots Keith in the back. Sonny drops down, fires. Tubbs happens to turn the corner at the same time. He gets there just too late. They lay, like, 19 bullets into Bates, and he goes down. But Keith is also down too. Keith Mullis, the key witness in the case against Cantero, has now been hit and he is dying. Sonny's freaking out. He's telling Tubbs to get a medevac. Tubbs calmly <sighs> says, I called him, bro. Yeah, like, like get him. I already called it. 
They had to protect him for three days. At the end of the three days, he still gets shot. Come on, guys. You, you couldn't protect him for ten more minutes. Yeah, you know? exactly. Three days and one extra hour. You've been good. It's okay. I'm the best dermatologist, and it's going to be fine. That's exactly what I wrote. They rush him to the <laughs> yeah. hospital, and Dr. Dermatologist comes out and says the kid's dying. Yeah, he's like, he's got blood everywhere. It's all in his lungs. I don't know what to do with him. I'm trying. So he's like, save him. He's like, I'm trying, but I don't know. Leaves. Also, a huge pimple right on his face. <laughs> that I have the medicine for. <laughs> FBI man comes running in and he says, hey, thanks to everyone. This went fantastic. I mean, I'm just so happy with how everything went. Grok is like, what the hell are you talking about? Keith's dying. He's like, no, trust me. We took precautions for this. You don't have the real witness. We would never give you the real <laughs> one. And this is when we learned the what the whole game here was. Not only were they using the vice team for bait to figure out what, who the mole was inside of their division of the FBI, but also that the real Keith Mollis is now testifying in court. And you know what? The real Keith Mollis is a little bitch. Yeah. <laughs> He's no little snitch, bitch, though. Yeah. <laughs> He's no snitch. Well, <laughs> yeah. He, keeps it. He, he doesn't testify. He doesn't testify because clearly they cannot protect him. If he learned anything <laughs> from the fake Keith Hall, it is that uh, within three days, he will probably be dead or <laughs> bleeding. Exactly. I do have a question. What happened to the Prince courthouse that was in that it's episode gone. with the basketball player? I don't know. Maybe that's the other side it's of the town. It's the courthouse <laughs> formerly known as Prince. <laughs> So now the real Keith Wallace, he backs out. He's not going to testify. And we see later that the judge is forced to toss the case. Kateros is going to get off scot-free. At the hospital, we find out now that he's not Keith Mollis, obviously. He's DEA agent Joey Harden. He's a terrible DEA agent. <laughs> <laughs> terrible agent. I mean, this whole time when the people were trying to kill him, he didn't help at all. In nope. fact, all he did was run, run off the boat and get shot. Exactly. I don't know what they're trading these guys in Quantico these days, but they're like, that, that was just, just poor agent work right there. Joey asks if the real Keith testified too, and Sonny lies and says, yeah, it went great. We got, we got Cantero. Everything's good. And then Joey starts to die again. And Sonny goes out and gets the nurses. The doctors come rushing in back to the courthouse. I mentioned they have to toss the case. Sonny comes out and gets right into Cantero's face and says, this isn't over, pal. It ain't over till it's over. But we know, like, yeah, it's over. It's we're over. Not, gonna, yeah, <laughs> not, gonna... not guilty, man. The gloves don't fit. You must have quit. <laughs> so now back at the hospital, it's like, oh, wait, Joey isn't actually dead. We got two more episodes he's going to be in. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, good, good, good. And so we forgot about them. We also find out that his dad was a... Uh, a cop that was killed on duty and probably one of Rocket's former partners. So <laughs> but I'm just speculating. In the last moments, we see that Sonny brought Joey a whole bunch of new music and he opens it up and it's music that Joey would actually like. It's like Anthrax and Megadeth and Metallica and stuff. And Tubbs asks him, like, is this your kind of music? And then Sonny says some joke and they freeze frame on the ending and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Get well soon, Timmy. <laughs> Turns out Crockett thought that was his son the whole time. <laughs> this this episode, I don't, I can't put my finger on it. I can't put my finger on what it is about this episode because I have like a serious love hate for it. And I'll go more into it in my final thoughts. But the story is there. Joey is the problem. <laughs> it's all you, Joey. <laughs> Joey Keith. Why can't we get John Le Legazama to come back or something? Come on, guys. <laughs> Before we get too deep into our final thoughts, let's go take a look at this week's music. We have some mega stars that make an appearance in this episode, too. Let's go break this one down. All right, John, let's take a look at this week's music. We have a episode about metal. So hopefully, fingers crossed, there's some big name metal band that will make an appearance. Like something that also includes like Harleys and big stage performances and stuff. What do you got for us this week? That's exactly what we have. Uh, you're <laughs> describing Ministry, right? <laughs> we have the song Stigmata by Ministry, and they are a U.S. industrial metal band founded in 1981. Probably the biggest band in the episode, you know, minus, you know. You know. 
two out of the other three. But <laughs> Jurgensen, his girlfriend, actually was the one that introduced him into the music scene in Chicago at the time. First band was called Special Effect. Followed that up with a short-lived band called the Carmichael's. He would meet the co-owners, the record label, Wax Tracks. He would record a demo with them, and they would and they would offer him a single as well as help, uh, basically help him form the band Ministry. At first, Jorgensen wasn't going to sing. He was just going to play guitar. They held auditions. They auditioned like 12 singers, and basically they all sucked. <laughs> so basically that led to uh, Jorgensen singing. They released the single Cold Life with Wax Tracks, which would turn out to be their first hit as a record label. They would get a contract from the single they did with Wax Tracks, but it would turn out to be a letdown. They would release the album with Sympathy because of the low sales. They would go back to Wax Tracks. They would release Twitch, which marked the end of more of their pop electronica phase and led to their core, what made them popular, with their releases of The Land of Rape, and Honey in 1988, and that would be the beginning of them bringing on the metal. They released this song, Stigmata, which would also be used in the uh, 1990 film Hardware. They'd follow that up with a 92 hour as as one of the headlining acts of Lollapalooza, and then they would re- release Filthy Pig. Uh, fairly successful, and then they would follow that up with Dark Side of the Spoon, which <laughs> I am finding that I am really liking their album name so far. <laughs> like, like, like Dark Side of the Spoon is actually the, dedicated to a former band member, William Tucker, who committed suicide earlier that year. They re- also released the song ba- Bad Blood on the Matrix soundtrack, as well as the song What About Up, which actually performed in a cameo role in Spielberg's AI. So around this time, 2001, Jorgensen actually almost lost his arm to a spider bite and he actually did lose a toe stepping on a discarded hypodermic needle he was also severely depressed this would lead to him getting clean with help of his agent angelina uh, lucasen who would later become his wife final album the last sucker in 2007 they would follow that up with a reunion tour, he would relapse. Guitarist Mike Seca would die on stage from a heart attack. Holy shit. Playing with wow. his side band, Rigor Mortis, <laughs> in 2012. They would release their last, last album, From Beer to Eternity, in 2013. Jurgensen would come out and say that the band can't go on anymore without Mikey. And then in February 2017, they began work on their 14th album, <laughs> which they promised to be their last, last, last album. <laughs> They're one of those metal bands that kind of fly under the radar. Unlike our next band in music, Iron Maiden, with the song Only the Good Die Young. Iron Maiden, I mean, it's freaking Iron Maiden. They yeah. are massive. Believe it or not, they were formed in 1969. Uh, I'm sorry, 1970. Or formed in 1975 on Christmas Day. <laughs> they were formed by bassist Steve Harris shortly after leaving his previous band smiler <laughs> the name always the back the previous <laughs> bands are always the best yes we're actually named after the iron maiden torture device which is like the coffin thing with the spikes in it so they were pioneers of the new wave of british heavy metal it blew up during the 80s with albums the number of the beast Peace of Mind and Power Slave. Uh, They're one of the most successful heavy metal bands in history. They've sold over 100 million records as of 2017. And they've performed over 2,000 live shows as of 2013 with 16 studio albums. So for 35 years, they've been rolling. And for 35 years, they have been supported by a zombie-like mascot named Eddie. Hmm. Now, Eddie first appeared as part of their album art and continued in every single one of their albums. Eddie is on the album. Also, they also dress someone like Eddie for shows, and Eddie likes to change his appearance. So sometimes he's a zombie, sometimes he's like a evil doctor. So, but it's always the same Eddie mascot. First show was uh, May 1976 for the took up residency at the Cart and Horses Pub in Stratford. Just sitting that Iron Maiden was a pub band. Part of the reason it took him a little bit of having to play in a pub 
was because numerous changes uh, in the band's early lineup would lead to Harry and Dave Murray remaining as the uh, band's longest standing members. But everyone else kind of wrote through different times. And everything started out with their 1978 demo. It was a four-song demo that got a little play at a local club. The club owner happened to like it, and he played it so much. Then they released a three-song demo and like, hey, guys, we can sell this shit. So they started <laughs> selling it. They sold out. Sold out the complete demo. And this caught the attention of a record company, EMI, signed them. And then by 1980, they released their self-titled debut album, which would peak number four on UK charts. They'd open for bands like Kiss and Judas Priest and do some European tours. One, they would release their second album, Killers. At this time, they would replace their drummer. In 82, they would release The Number of the Beast, which would be their first number one on UK charts. And top ten in a whole bunch of other countries. So, and that would include songs like Children of the Damned and Run to the Hills. Uh, uh, Run to the Hills. To the hills. <laughs> and that actually uh, stirred up some stuff. A uh, Christian activist actually called them Satanist, started destroying their records, which I'm sure <laughs> only made them sell better. By the way, people, buying their record to destroy it only supports the band. <laughs> the more you know. They would go through more drummers and more drummers, uh, about as many drummers as Spinal Tap. Uh, <laughs> that would lead to Welcome to the Big Time, the World Slavery Tour. Once again, fantastic naming. <laughs> the World of Slavery Tour was 193 shows in 28 countries over 13 months to an estimated 3.5 million people. Damn. From 86 to 90, that just continued success. It also started to get some 90 solo projects in between stuff from other band members. And that lead to Bruce Dixon, who was the, in 93, who was the vocalist at the time, the singer. He would leave the band to pursue a solo career. They would audition and go through thousands of tapes before convincing Blaze Bailey, formerly of Wolfane, to join the band. They would record an album to mixed reception. The album X Factor would basically chart their lowest possession position since 1981. They would continue on with Bailey, who would eventually ask to leave the band himself. He basically kicked himself out of the band due to poor performance. No one likes uh, at me, a guys. band meeting. Like literally <laughs> Yeah. I'm I should just home. go. Which, yeah. which would lead them to inviting Bruce Dixon back, because uh, apparently things solo-wise weren't going well. And he would only come back as long as they brought back Adrian Smith, too. They would have a resurgence in, of popularity in the 2000s that would lead to tours, festivals. And they are even planning a new tour in 2018 through 2019. I'm in for it. And here's what I'm going to say. Right now, you can go on... You can go see a tour where it has artists like Sir Mix a Lot, Vanilla Ice, and some other 90s hip hop band. They're like all touring together. There's a bunch of those those types of tours. I am totally down for one of those like old man tours, but for metal. So give me Iron Maiden, Slayer, Sepultura doing a tour together, or even maybe Suicidal Tendencies in on that. I'm in. No, no ministry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No comment Sorry. on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we've talked about ministry. Now we've talked about Iron Maiden. You can't possibly get bigger than that, can you? I mean, can you? <laughs> well, you can, guys, because we have Madam X by Rugged Edge. <laughs> Rugged Edge, obviously, Florida's most famous local band from the late 80s, early 90s. That specifically did shows at Miami's Cameo Theater and had big mohawks and played UK punk style from 1985 to 99. Now, I know that's pretty specific. They are the best of that. I mean, it's pretty specific. <laughs> <laughs> they did have one full length album, at least one, in 1989 called Eclipse of Fire. Be somewhat serious for a minute. Rugged Edge was actually a really popular local band in Florida. It was kind of cool that Vice actually got them onto the show because that was right about the time when they were opening for some like seriously big band, including bands like Mystery and, and 
Iron Maiden and such when they came mm. through. This was the go-to band to open for these guys. Like everyone thought like that was they were just gonna break out of this scene. Except well, Florida's not really known for having much of a punk scene. I don't think I can name very many punk bands to come out of Florida. I can name about the LA punk scene. I can name about ten or twenty bands that came out of there. But unfortunately for Rugged Edge, not too many Miami Florida punk there. I, I, I don't know. They might still be around too, by the way. <laughs> I think I saw Facebook. So the Facebook doesn't have much information, but you can direct message them. And I'm sure if you offered them money, they would play your quinceanera or your birthday. I'm giving you a shout out, Rugged Edge. Don't let me down. I'm serious. They actually do have a Facebook page if you, if you look them up. I don't know if they check it, but I really hope so. If you get them to play your birthday party please send us footage of rugged <laughs> edge playing and we will include it on the website listen rugged edge here's what we're saying we might be scheduling a trip to miami for the end of our show about miami vice we would love to set up set you up at a park and then have you play <laughs> madam x we also, while we're there we, we also we've never had a theme song for the show so <laughs> i'm just saying guys we... <laughs> there you go <laughs> We could pay you okay, all right. five dollars. Five whole dollars. <laughs> I guess we gotta wrap this thing up. So the last band, not very big. These guys called Derek and the Dominoes. Yeah, who um, like it's got some guy like it, it, it Aaron Aaron Slapson. What's <laughs> his name? <laughs> I don't know. The song's called Layla. I, I think you can get it on iTunes. Uh, <laughs> no, okay. So let me get all serious here. I am not going to go into my love affair for Eric Clapton. <laughs> so, it's embarrassing, um, quite frankly. <laughs> and we could go on forever about good old slow hand. Let's just talk about Derek and the Dominoes, because Derek and the Dominoes was only about a two-year period. So Derek and the Dominoes were a blues rock band formed in the spring of 1970 by Eric Clapton, but it was formed by him and keyboardist and singer Bobby Whitlock and also included bassist Carl Gretel and drummer Jimmy Gordon. But all four of them had previously played together in Clapton's last band called Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. The only difference was that Delaney and Bonnie weren't in this new band because Delaney and Bonnie were a couple and they bickered a lot and um, the guys got kind of tired of hanging out with them. So they kicked them out of the band and they <laughs> called themselves Derek and the Dominoes. <laughs> they actually weren't going to be called Derek and the Dominoes at first. They thought about calling themselves Eric Clapton and Friends, or at least Eric Clapton thought about calling himself <laughs> Eric Clapton and Friends. That was his idea. <laughs> <laughs> but they showed up at the first show and a dispute broke out backstage. Which led to them quickly changing their name to Derek and the Dominoes. Like, sorry, they decided on Derek and the Dominoes. No, Clapton decided on Derek and the Dominoes because Clapton loved it. The rest of the band, eh, they didn't really <laughs> like it, but they stuck with Derek and the Dominoes, which I guess is better than Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. <laughs> They also backed him on Clapton's solo album. Clapton's first solo album didn't do very well, which is kind of what led to the creation of Derek and the Dominoes. So Derek and the Dominoes only released one studio album, and that was Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs. They flew down to, to Miami in 1970 and recorded what are called the Layla Sessions. The funny thing about it is that Layla, the song, and the album Layla, the other assorted love songs, it didn't really gain any traction until 1972 when it would finally become a hit and start getting radio play and until that point. It had really been kind of a failure. Clapton and the guys, they fly down to Miami. They're going to record a double album. They're staying at a hotel, and they're having a hell of a time coming up with things to record. Now, Clapton is quoted, quote, We were staying in this hotel on the beach, and whatever drug you wanted, you could get it at the newsstand. Girl would just take your orders. So that is kind of cool that there is a little bit of Miami vice viceness to this, and <laughs> that, you know, the band would go to an Allman Brothers concert, and that's what would inspire them to record the album. Clapton would meet Dwayne Almond, and the two would become like like instant best friends. Also involved in the album was George Harrison. So why why is George Harrison? Uh, so George Harrison and Clapton were friends. This is where things kind of get complicated. The, the song Layla that the album's named after, the main song on the album, that that song's about. 
George Harrison's wife at the, or girlfriend at the time. <laughs> Where is it? No, his wife at the time. During this time, Eric Clapton would have an affair with George Harrison's wife. Damn. Uh, that was, she was Layla. He had cheated on his wife, Patty, a bunch. And so she decided she was going to cheat on him. And Clapton and Patty kind of, you know, they hit it off. She would eventually break it off with Harrison, marry Eric Clapton, and which later would lead to a divorce between them. She would eventually leave George Harrison and marry Eric Clapton. By the way, Patty Boyd, she's inspired some pretty big songs. Boyd was li- is, was named as the inspiration by George Harrison for his songs, if, if I Need Someone, Something, which is a Beatles song, and For You, which is also a Beatles song, hmm. all about Patty Boyd. Clapton, yeah. he also wrote two pretty big songs about Patty, this one, and Wonderful Tonight, one of his other biggest hits. Ultimately, he would say Derek and the Dominoes was a time in which Clapton would <clears throat> Clapton lose some close friends, he would lose Jimi Hendrix, and then a year later, Dwayne Allman would die. And at the same time he was going through this, doing a, a bunch of drugs, and he had fallen in love with his best friend's wife, and that would eventually divide the band. The band wouldn't survive it. They'd release Layla. Clapton would eventually go back out on his own. This is where it gets even crazier. Drummer Jim Gordon, who had basically survived that whole time in the band as an undiagnosed schizophrenic, and and years later, he killed his mother with a hammer during a psychotic episode. And he is confined, even to this day, since 1984 to this day, in a mental institution. Damn. Craziness aside, other members, I mean, this would all lead to Clapton taking a three-year hiatus. And during that hiatus, all people, Pete Townsend of the Who, would help him get clean and get him <laughs> back on track. <laughs> This one, I knew this one was stacked, and this is kind of a music episode anyway, because it's got like the heavy metal theme going all the way through it. Oh, super metal, super metal. It, uh, the drummer killed his mom with a hammer. I mean, how, metal, <laughs> how much more metal can I get? <laughs> all I'll say in closing is ministry. I, if you're on the tour, I'm not going to be there for you. So I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. It's mostly, I think, if I have to guess, it's mostly going to be final thoughts on uh, Lazen. <laughs> so, or Lazard. Sorry. <laughs> That's going to be most thoughts about him in particular. Let's go give our final thoughts. Okay, I'm going to start. This would have been a good Vice episode. It's got the right story. We got a dirty cop. We got the FBI. We got the old switcheroo with the FBI with our using the Miami Vice as a bait tool to try and lure out the dirty FBI agent in their ranks. They also have, they're using the decoy, who's also a DEA agent, which has insights to other things. It's like, there's all the right pieces are there, except for Joey. (laughs) Joey Harden is a problem, and he is so annoying throughout this entire episode. I stopped caring about everything else that was happening because Joey Harden is so freaking annoying, I could not handle him anymore. <laughs> and that's where it put me with this episode. This is good. Cantero is a good bad guy, even though you only see him in the courtroom. The story is all there. All the pieces are there. We just had a different actor for Joey. <laughs> that's all, <laughs> all we needed. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Well, I mean, I can't disagree with you. <laughs> He's very annoying. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, it's disappointing they didn't actually get a... a we're, we're just really <laughs> raking on this guy, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, actor. come on, guys. Do you think he do? You, do you not think that he feels bad about second chances or getting <laughs> Central Park West canceled? Or what about that show Extreme? Because I mean, they couldn't make a show about Rocky Mountain Rescuers work. <laughs> yeah, I I think the storyline is there. The the all the other characters are fine. I mean, you you don't like the FBI agents? They're swarmy and they don't know what they're doing. And they're obviously. Uh, they they could have killed people, get people killed with their their sneaky thing they have going on. And the bad guy's a real bad guy. And but then there's Joey. He just he just can't do it. <laughs> he can't be cool for the episode. <laughs> he talks all the time. He's stupid. You don't really feel sorry for him. <laughs> and when he lives at the end, you're like, damn, he's gonna come back. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? This is classic Vice, the plot we've seen. This is like our 15th dirty FBI agent. This is like our 30th we've got to protect. Everything's there for it to be a a 
classic Vice episode. But you're right. Joey kind of just showed it. Like, I'll admit, after five seasons, I'm kind of checking out a little bit about the whole, hey, we got to protect the witness. And there's a dirty FBI agent. I'm a little tired of that check. But, like, it has all the makings of a good Vice episode. But for some reason, it's not. And I hear you guys with the Joey, especially knowing that he's going to be Lil Crockett in the next couple episodes, maybe. <laughs> but that's not what I'm focusing on. My biggest issue with this episode is that we have seen them go theme before with other episodes, you know, like a punk theme or a certain political topic theme in the episode. This is your metal episode, guys? <laughs> like, this is your metal episode. Like, like, like meat fondler episode was more metal than this episode. <laughs> We've got guys in music dying on stage from heart attacks in bands called Rigor Mortis. <laughs> we have other guys murdering their moms with hammers. But no, we're going to do the standard protect the witness with the least metal Joey, who is the least metal kid pretending to be a metal kid, I guess. I'm just disappointed. If metal music was the theme, it should have been full bore, all hands on deck, full metal show. Instead, just get kind of a half ass episode with just really good music. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Let us know where you stand on this episode. We were extremely hard on Joey. <laughs> And he's not undeserved. <laughs> but let us know how you feel about Joey. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. I mentioned at the top, we're going to have some new schedule for the next month or so. For the next like four episodes, we'll be on the bi-weekly schedule, not forever. Trying to slow down as little as possible, motoring as fast as we can to the end of the show. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe. You can find all the ways to support us, support step number one. Please give us a review on your podcast platform of choice iTunes, preferably, if you listen to us on there. Go ahead and give us the highest ranking, five stars. I didn't say that out loud, <laughs> but but five stars would be great. But do not <laughs> write a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Instead, go in there and give us a full, detailed list of what a metal episode of Vice should be, including Running for the Hills. Write that right into that review. Make sure you're clear on what they should have done in this episode. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.